Hallo, herzlich willkommen zu Folge 28 von unserem Café Steelpoint. In der heutigen Sendung, im heutigen Abend, wird es wieder, ums Thema, wieder einmal um das Thema Vagus gehen. Das ist ja etwas, was wir schon einmal bei der Polyvagaltheorie hatten und was auch in der Embryologie schon ein bisschen vorkam. Und wir haben heute einen Gast aus Kanada. Pascal Grolot ist ursprünglich Belgier, hat in Belgien Physiotherapie und Osteopathie studiert und dann als Osteopath in vielen verschiedenen Ländern praktiziert und er unterrichtet seit vielen Jahren Osteopathie und hat sich in den letzten äh, fünf oder sechs Jahren auf das Thema Vagus spezialisiert, hat da geforscht an der Universität in Halifax und dort in der Nähe wohnt und arbeitet auch im Moment und äh, hält zu diesem Thema Vagus auch seine Postgraduate-Kurse ab, die er in vielen verschiedenen Ländern anbietet. Herzlich willkommen, Pascal. Welcome and thank you for accepting to attend our Café Stillpoint and to come for a webinar and a short presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Raymond. I'm very honored that uh, I will give you this presentation for you. Canada is a, a five hour, uh, has got five hours time difference, but it's the better direction. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had Michael Mulholland from Sydney here, uh, here with me, and he had to get up at five in the morning to, to join us for the evening in Europe. So Canada is quite convenient, actually, at that time. It is, yes. Uh, I just introduced you a little bit. I told people that you're coming from Belgium. Uh, how does a Belgian osteopath uh, end up in Halifax or near Halifax in Canada? How did you get there and why? All right, so uh, to make short, uh, before I came here, I was uh, in south of France mm -hmm. and I was teaching there uh, in the uh, uh, College of Osteopathy in Avignon in south of France, mm -hmm. Ifoga. And I was teaching uh, neurology there and uh, uh, neurosemiology over there. And, uh, and, and practicing as well over there. And, uh, and then uh, suddenly uh, I kept in touch with a colleague, uh, also was an osteopath teaching there. And I just realized that he moved with his, all his family here in Canada, not in Halifax, another province next, next door. And we have a chat and uh, he told me, Pascal, you have to come here uh leave france you have to come here there is only a few osteopaths here it's just starting building they don't practice the same osteopathy that in europe and you are graduate from europe and uh so patient they prefer to see osteopath graduated from europe than mm -hmm. from canada and he told me uh we need people like you here with your skills and and uh, i uh, uh i mean number of experience uh, 23 years practicing and I was thinking about that and I say why not mm -hmm. and uh, therefore I was uh, looking for opportunity and a clinic here in Halifax was interested to hire me therefore I made the decision to come mm -hmm. here and to develop my business mm -hmm. there very very so courageous very courageous to move to 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 another continent to to and to a cold climate from the south of france yeah but you know i'm from belgium right okay. originally so, and, uh, so you're so, used to bad weather oh yes and i used to live in switzerland mm -hmm. so uh i'm used to the cold but before france i used to live in the ua and mm -hmm. this was very warm there I'm, I'm sure and then france and then here mm -hmm. but not no i'm staying here it's a beautiful country and how did you get interested in the vegas so uh in france i was hiring uh in this college of osteopathy in france to teach neurology mm -hmm. and uh and uh, neurosemiology and i was always interested to uh about neurology because I did my uh, a doctoral thesis at the time in Switzerland in the Department of Neuro Neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. So neurosurgery, neurology. So uh, I knew a lot about uh, neurology at that time and uh, I was very confident. And then, and then teaching in France neurology was very easy for me. 
And uh, at that time, I heard about uh, vagus nerve stimulation, but they were talking only about the invasive vagus nerve stimulation. And I was very interested about that. And then uh, I did a lot of uh, uh, article review, uh, try to understand the mechanism and uh, how it works. And after it's just a common sense, you have to know your physiology and, and uh, of course, and your anatomy. And then uh, I decided to uh, to, uh, to to try to understand myself by research. So I published last year uh, non-invasive uh, vagus nerve stimulation in uh, in a private uh, medical center uh, related to anxiety, uh, to uh, irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. and to chronic pain. And uh, I publish uh, this article. Uh, so it took a while <clears throat> to do the research with patient I had in the clinic, mm -hmm. and uh, I published in the Journal of Neurology and Neuromedicine uh, at the end of last year. Th thank you. We we will try to get the reference for your article and publish it under the video, so 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 people can look it up afterwards if they're interested. Okay. So the vagus nerve, we, we, we discussed it briefly before. It, it's a huge subject. Uh, which parts are you teaching and what are we going to hear today? So about the vagus nerve, because I'm practicing the non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation with patient and have a very, very good result uh, uh, to people. They tried everything before and uh, with low result or taking medication and uh, side effect of medication for very complex pathology mm -hmm. that uh, the vagus nerve stimulation bring the solution better than manual treatment, uh, um, osteopathic treatment. Anyway, the vagus nerve can be approached in the body in different uh, parts. And um, so what I'm teaching is the relationship between the vagus nerve as, uh, as uh, the main part of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. So, I mean, autonomic nervous system. And uh, it's it's, it's linked to uh, neuroendocrino immunology. So uh, we learn more about the vagus nerve and know uh, we don't make any difference now between the autonomic nervous system and the uh, neuroendocrine immunological system. They are just uh, linked and part together um, because the vagus nerve is a very powerful um, or is a key in, in the uh, in, is a key in, in neuroendocrine immunology. So that's what I'm teaching and uh, teaching uh, uh, what's the mechanism uh, <clears throat> towards it in very detail. So go, I go to uh, even the, the molecular aspect of it and understand that uh, the vagus nerve uh, is not only acetylcholine at the end, but uh, it can uh, synthesize different neurotransmitters and is also um, he has receptors for many many uh, <clears throat> chemicals uh, or uh, mechanoreceptors or uh, pain receptors and uh, other uh, and hormones and other neurotransmitters and I show uh, all <clears throat> this uh, is afterwards uh, very dependent to disease mm -hmm. and so today. I will uh, I will uh, make a talk about the relationship between the vagus nerve and the mechanism of disease. Mm -hmm. And I think you have some slides prepared. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. So let's let's see if we are able to get those slides uh, on the screen. All right. So we are talking about the vagus nerve and mechanism of disease. So this is a general principle that is common to all disease, right? So it's very easy because all diseases share the same mechanism at the end. And we will see the relationship between the vagus nerve and those mechanisms of disease in a very general way. So 
the common the common uh, mechanism uh, that lead to DZ and which are in connection with the vagus nerve. Here I uh, talk about three examples, but we can uh, extend it to uh, autoimmune uh, disease, uh, other autoimmune disease, cancer is an autoimmune disease, Alzheimer as well, right? Uh, but we can relay the same mechanism for depression, we say, can relay the same mechanism for uh, Crohn's disease, for uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, and uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome or uh, other uh, um, autoimmune disorder like uh, even psoriasis or, or, or whatsoever. So here we take an example about the cardiovascular disease, the cancer and Alzheimer's disease uh, because you will see that the mechanisms of disease are related and are always the same trigger that will lead to this kind of, of, of disease showing here, right? So, and uh, uh, we know also that apart from disease, right, uh, there is uh, the metabolic syndrome, uh, which it's a cluster of uh, risk factor that include uh, obesity, as you know, and uh, dyslipidemia, uh, high blood pressure, hyperglycemia, and those those cluster can also can be considered as a disease as such, right? Because we know that uh, uh, those those cluster uh, will promote a systemat systematic uh, systemic uh, uh, inflammatory uh, response. All right, but the vicious part is that also this met are also risk factor for the uh, the other disease like cardiovascular disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, right? So the question after that is if there is a common denominator that, are, that could be related to the multiple underlying physiopathological mechanism that leads to those diseases, right? And then I will talk at the end of the presentation if we can benefit from a <coughs> single non-invasive and inexpensive method to, uh, to analyze and to identify people at risk and possibly by uh, appropriate treatment prevent those disease. So why the vagus nerve could be the common de de denominator for, for uh, those disease, not only those three, but generally speaking, right? So because we know, this is by research, that the weak activity of the vagus nerve, let's say low tone, it's a risk factor for disease. So, for example, cardiovascular cancer and here Alzheimer's disease, right? Because uh, uh, inadequate or a, a lower tone of the vagal activity act as a risk factor because it will exacerbate the underlying mechanism that leads with disease, right? And what is those mechanisms? It's very easy and it's all, always the same inflammation, oxidative stress, and excessive sympathetic nervous system activity, all right? Now, the sympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve uh, is the most part of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's about 80% of the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we talk about parasympathetic, we can always, I mean, say, oh yeah, I'm talking about the vagus nerve actually. And the vagus nerve is so important because as you know that uh, it innervate uh, almost all, or all organ in the body, right? And, but also it modulates directly and indirectly uh, about 80% of the total volume of the brain. So it participate in, in a lot of uh, brain activity from the basic one to the most uh, uh, complex one, right? So the, the, the vagus nerve activity it moderates and in, in interact, right? We, are, we, we know about allo, allostatic load. So allostatic load is related to the vagal activity, right? And he, 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 he moderates uh, these underlying mechanisms, right? Which <coughs> also 
uh, can be a risk factor to other disease like the diabetes in the case of uh, metabolic uh, uh, syndrome, right? And it can predict the risk of those diseases. So this is this is uh, very well known now by uh, the the most recent research about this. So those three mechanisms that you can see down: oxidative stress, DNA damage, which is linked with oxidative stress, excessive inflammation and excessive sympathetic nerve activity play a crucial role in those diseases, as well as in the metabolic syndrome. So you can tell yourself, if the oxidative stress is a, is a low level, if there is no excessive inflammation, and if there is no excessive sympathetic nerve activity, then they, there uh, should be no disease and, and uh, whatever the disease it is. And actually this is the case, right? So let's talk about them. So oxidative stress. So, you know, it's, it's when there is an imbalance between oxidant and antioxidant, as you say, right? And when uh, oxidative stress, which in favor of the first, right? Uh, it will process to uh, leading to DNA damage, right? Uh, and this is the case, for instance, in uh, coronary heart disease, right? Uh, uh, because we have the LDL oxidation and this oxidative stress will promote inflammation, you know, of uh, arteriosclerotic plaque in the case of uh, in the coronary uh, arteries. Okay, so oxidative stress is very important because it's pivotal in transformation of healthy cells also into cancer cells and it contributes to DNA mutation, right? Depends of uh, all the tumor killer factor and also other pro-oncogenes genes are affected. But it starts with this oxidative stress that uh, will uh, have a, a very detrimental um, uh, uh, detrimental action uh, in cells that can lead it to cancer. But oxidative stress is also uh, increased in cerebrovascular accident and as well lead to DNA damage in the brain tissue, right? So it's so all linked. And oxidative stress, for our example here, induce neural apoptosis in Alzheimer's disease, right? So we can see that oxidative stress and DNA damage is one of the key factors that are leading to the disease, but, but not only one. So inflammation, you know that uh, our body has a, a low level of inflammation. This is very necessary because otherwise we will sick all the time. So inflammation helps us to build uh, our immune system, right? And uh, it's very beneficial. But we know that, uh, for instance, in uh, cardiovascular disease, right? Uh, here, arteriosclerosis, inflammation will lead to the recruitment and migration of immune cells like macrophage as it's always the case, right, in case of inflammation, to the arterial uh, lesion. And this inflammation will destabilize and at the end will rupture the plates, uh, promote elevation of arterial pressure and can lead to, to a stroke, for instance, right? So in case of, of cancer, inflammation induced thrombosis in neocancer and inflammation prevent apoptose because it will inhib inhibit the tumor suppressor factor, the TK, mm -hmm. and it will stimulate the angiogenesis, right? And then it will promote the metastasis. So we can say that without inflammation or just with our basic level of inflammation, right? There is no reason to have cancer and cancer is autoimmune disease, as I said previously. It can be considered as autoimmune because, because it's too much inflammation and, and the, the, the macrophage cells that are involved uh, in this inflammatory process, right, are releasing too much or excessive pro 
uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? Uh, like uh, the uh, necrosis tumor factor alpha and other interleukins uh, and other uh, other pro-inflammatory uh, uh, molecules. Um, so in Alzheimer disease, inflammation will uh, mediate the negative effect of the uh, beta amyloid peptides on brain neurons that will in turn lead to neurodegenerations. And so when there is inflammation in your body, wherever there is inflammation or inflammation start, it will spread everywhere, including the brain, you know, the, the gut brain axis and the vagus nerve participate, uh, of course, in this uh, gut brain axis. And we know that uh, uh, some, some disease uh, or mental uh, health disease start in the, in the gut. And uh, the gut, the leaky gut with overinflammation get there, go to the brain, and then it will affect uh, uh, the, uh, the neural plasticity and it will lead to degeneration like in Alzheimer, but uh, multiple sclerosis is, is the same. So inflammation, if it's too excessive in, uh, in volume, in amplitude and in time, it's a major contributing factor to the start of multiple chronic and autoimmune disease. This is very important to know that. No, the sympathetic activity, the, the, the sympathetic nervous system and the vagus nervous system, they, they act together, uh, together to, uh, to keep this inflama inflammation level in our body uh, normal. We have the, the release of cortisol uh, and uh, other uh, 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 anti-inflammatory uh, agent uh, like norepinephrine or dopamine, right? And this contribute to uh, low down the level of, uh, of inflammation. But the problem is that when there is excessive sympathetic activity and when we have a uh, 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 so, uh, this homeostasis, when the sympathetic nervous system is too high in activity, and you know, this is the, the flight and fight, and we have the, the vagus tone, which is too low for any reason, right? This over uh, activity of the sympathetic nervous system, in the case of uh, cardiovascular disease, right, it will contribute to vascular will damage to increase vasoconstriction. This is part of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, right? And therefore it will increase the blood pressure, right? And therefore it will, uh, it will uh, induce uh, arteriosclerosis and is ischemic process, coronary disease. In cancer, the excessive release of sympathetic neurotransmitters like uh, norepinephrine, right? will induce the angiogenesis and uh, influence the metastatic process because we know that overactivity of the sympathetic uh, nervous system contribute to uh, uh, tumor cells growth and contributes to, uh, to develop met metastases, right? And we know that if we block uh, the norepinephrine release, we can slow down this process. Now, if we take about the uh, mental health issue like Alzheimer, you know, uh, cerebral flow will be decreased in the brain. So the perfusion will be the decrease in the brain. So uh, less oxy um, uh, oxygenation, right? And probably because uh, there will be uh, also vasoconstriction there uh, due to excessive uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system activity. And we know that if uh, we inject uh, acetylcholine, which is related to uh, the, the vagus nerve, right? Uh, uh, we can we can uh, dec we can have an action on the, the cerebral flow because we know that uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation uh, improve uh, blood uh, uh, perfusion and uh, oxygenation is in the brain. 
Therefore, vagus nerve stimulation is very in, is a, is a very good indication after stroke, for instance, because we need to have a very uh, powerful and uh, very good uh, cere cerebral flow there. Okay, blood flow there. So, oxidative stress and DNA damage, inflammation, and excessive sympathetic nerve activity contribute to the development of interrelated disease, like uh, here the metabolic syndrome, right? Right, hypertension, uh, high blood pressure, and that can lead to diabetes, uh, especially diabetes 2 at the end, you know, and it also is factor for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, right? So, <clears throat> and all disease may peak in the metabolic syndrome, uh, syndrome or other risk factor for this disease, okay? But at first, we have always increase oxidative stress DNA damage, increase inflammation, uncontrolled inflammation, and over excessive uh, sympathetic nerve activity. Uh, excuse so me, yes, Pascal, yeah. uh, may, yeah. may, may I ask a question or two uh, at, at, at that point? Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you seem to, uh, you seem to uh, talk a lot about uh, sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system as antagonists, and often uh, in the uh, often it seems that you say the sympathetics are too high, and so we want to stimulate the vagus. I, is, isn't it isn't it uh, the case that this uh, model of antagonism is not quite up to date? It, uh, and that sometimes you can have both, you can have high vagus and high uh, sympathetic activity. It's not exactly this balance that we used to think it is, is it? So, uh, normally in case of homeostasis, we have good vagus tone and we have, uh, we have a ba balanced vagus tone and we have a balanced sympathetic activity, right? We know that by aging, the vagus tone decrease. This is just a normal physiological process. We know, for instance, that uh, elderly people they suffer, uh, they may suffer more from osteoporosis, right, than uh, than young people, mm -hmm. just because low vagus uh, tone or activity in elderly people will promote osteoclastic uh, processes that will lead to osteoporosis. So if we have a good vagus tone, you will never get osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So now, in case of disease, you can have, uh, you can have dysautonomia, all right? So uh, usually we say uh, it's a hypersympathicotonia, mm -hmm. but we can have also hyperparasympathicotonia, mm -hmm. right? It can be high, or it can be low, okay? This autonomia could be uh, uh, low or high. Mm -hmm. Normally, in healthy people, the vagus tone, uh, and the, 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 the parasympathetic, let's talk about the vagus because it represents 80% uh, of the parasympathetic, and this uh, sympathetic nerve activity, they are very good friends and they work together. Mm -hmm. But it is not the case in this autonomia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I do I answer the question? Yeah, yes, I, I think so. It, it, I was just I was just uh, what I just wanted to ask because you seem to use it almost as a synonym uh, to say uh, high high sympathetic activity and low vagal activity, and I just wanted to to ask for that. So no, there is not there is two different stuff, right? Good. But we know mm -hmm. that when there is a high sympathetic, we will. We will you we might have a low vagus tone, but it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. We can have a high sympathetic and a high vagus tone, so it's a uh, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a uh, dysautonomia. So it's high parasympathetic, let's say, right? Thank but thank actually, you. this that, that, that this, this high vagus tone is not balanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, one one thing uh, you you talked about. Uh, oxidative stress inflammation uh, as mechanism of disease and that, that was that was very interesting and very clear but uh, uh, maybe you could say more about the role of the vagus what what does the vagus have to do with oxidative stress 
it's, uh, it's I in, will, in, I in, will, in I many will, ways it's an, will, an environmental problem and a nutritional problem, isn't it? It is, it is. The vagus nerve is not the only solution, uh, unfortunately, otherwise it would be uh, very easy, but it's a very good one. So uh, let me finish this yes, and then sorry. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will talk about, uh, you will understand, right? Mm -hmm. So here is just a recap about oxidative stress DNA damage. It's one of the condition. Second is inflammation, and and then uh, uh, excessive uh, sympathetic nerve activity. I mean, it's one, two, three. You can put uh, whatever. They are all together, right? You cannot separate inflammation, oxidative stress, or uh, excessive uh, sympathetic activity because excessive sympathetic activity will also promote inflammation, right? And it will induce oxidative stress. So they are all working together. And this promotes the, the mechanism of disease and also the met metabolic syndromes like uh, uh, hyper uh, triglycerides and high blood pressure, um, you know, and then can lead to diabetes. And, and then uh, this can promote other disease or stimulate more other disease, right? But at the end, it's, it's those three basic mechanisms. So here you see the vagus tone and you can see the vagus tone is uh, it's negatively correlated to those, those disease. Means that when you have a, a very high vagus tone, right, you will see that the oxidative stress will be low. You will see that the inflammation will be low. You will see that uh, excessive sympathetic nerve activity will be low as well. At the opposite, if you have very low vagus tone, then you promote the disease, the metabolic syndrome, and the, the, the death at the end. So all the vagus tone uh, interfere with, with this, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, this is part of the, the course that I teach. Uh, and uh, because in this course, I am talking about neuroendocrinology, and it's very, very complex because the vagus, the vagus nerve, let's say, parasympathetic, let's say, uh, autonomic nervous system. Actually, we know recently that the autonomic nervous system uh, primary role or role or function, actually, it's a neuroendocrine and immune function. So, no, so it, it's, it's, it's the case for uh, the sympathetic, it's the case for the vagus or parasympathetic and is the case for the uh, enteric nervous system. So this I demonstrate uh, very well in detail in, in those courses. And uh, because it's a very big subject and uh, because we know the vagus tone has uh, a lot of receptors, not only acetylcholine, and uh, yes, receptor for a digestive hormone like uh, cholecystokinin. Uh, which is important hormone to digest the, the grease, but also the leptin, the ghrelin, and also, yes, uh, other receptor for pain, for uh, uh, chemicals, for uh, mecha mechanical receptors, and uh, other hormones, uh, right, and other uh, uh, neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters, which are linked to the vagus nerve or the sympathetic, also are very in relation with the uh, the classical hormone like estrogen, progesterone, right, or androgen uh, hormones, and uh, that's why it makes a very complex neuroendocrine immunology because the immunology is part of uh, the uh, the function of the vagus nerve on the immune self, all right, like uh, innate immune self, like the macrophage. And uh, or monocyte or monocyte uh, or uh, other uh, innate um, immune cells, and uh, we know since 2002 that the vagus nerve, uh, when it's stimulated, it will release acetylcholine, and uh, and this uh, also uh, with the, the the help of norepinephrine will be linked to the T cells in the macrophage. And uh, when the T cells are excited by norepinephrine, 
they will release, the T cell will release acetylcholine at the end. Acetylcholine, you know, it's a very classical neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system. And when the T cells in the macrophage will release the, the acetylcholine, it will block the macrophage activity to, uh, to, uh, to deliver uh, pro-inflammatory cyt cytokine like the TNF or other interleukins that will pro promote afterwards uh, excessive inflammation. And then we get the oxidative stress and then we have an excessive uh, uh, sympathetic ner nervous system activity. So this is very well uh, detailed in, in the two courses. Uh, because one is focused about neuroimmunology, the other one is focused about uh, more neuroendocrinology, it's very complex, and you will see in detail all those mechanisms, because the vagus nerve is not limited to only one anti-inflammatory pathway, but several ones. And the sympathetic nervous system is also uh, linked with this to promote inflammation, uh, those are called the gateway reflexes, uh, to promote the, the spreading in, of inflammation in the in, in, in the body, and those are a mechanism that were recently discovered. It was uh, two years ago. Uh, it is very very brand new, and so we have a, a more comprehensive understanding about the uh, neuroendocrinoimmunological um, uh, function of the the the, the, vagus to, the vagus nerve, but also. Uh, in general, the uh, autonomic nervous system. So, as I said before, you see, we need we need a basic level of uh, of inflammation, right? We have leukocyte recruitment, okay. Uh, we have uh, antibacterial activity. We have then de uh, dendritic uh, dendritic dendritic cells maturation, which is also uh, immune cells, right? And we know that if this cytokine level increase, the pro one, pro-inflammatory one increase, it will lead to all those different kinds of disease. And you see, there is depression, but there is fever is the first, uh, you know, response from the body when it's too much inflammation but also can lead to anorexia, to pain, to psoriasis, autoimmune disease as well, uh, arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and then colitis uh, in case of uh, 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 bowel syndrome disease. And, and if it's too much, too much, too much, we, it leads to organ failure and, and shock and death, right? So, and this, this was, uh, uh, explained by Kevin Tracy uh, uh, in 2007. And so this is the cytokine theory of, of, of inflammation, or I would say more, it's the cytokine theory of disease. In the course, we will see the history uh, of, uh, of immunology, right? And the last one we have for explaining uh, disease is the cytokine theory. So, but this is very well explained in the courses. So, why the vagus nerve is a, it's a key, uh, key player, right, in the uh, physiopathological mechanism to contribute to the development of disease? Because vagus nerve stimulation reduces oxidative stress and the defragmation of uh, DNA in cardiovascular disease. Acetylcholine, as the classical neurotransmitter of the, the parasympathetic, so the vagus, inhibits cell proliferation and increase level of uh, tumor killer cells uh, in different experimental studies. Vagotomy or capsaicin-induced innervation stimulate cancerous metastasis, right? And capsaicin uh, denervation, capsaicin is a, it's a pain, uh, pain molecule right? Uh, <clears throat> so if, if we do a vagotomy or we, we uh, put a stress uh, by injecting this capsaicin, uh, you know, to uh, destroy the nerve, it will stimulate cancerous metastasis. And also anti-inflammatory drug that activate the vagus nerve because it will alter the substance uh, P level will reduce
uh, tumor growth in a model of breast cancer in mice, right? So this is by recent uh, study. And high vagal activity uh, significantly moderates uh, prostate-specific uh, antigen, so the PSA, uh, in, uh, in uh, prostate cancer patient. So this we know, and we know how it works. Again, this is uh, explained in, in the courses, right? Uh, we know also that uh, low vagal activity can interact with genetic and environmental factors, which may explain why in people with the same vagal activity, some will develop, develop Alzheimer's disease, why other will develop cancer or, or, uh, or uh, <clears throat> uh, cardiovascular disease, right? Because we, unfortunately, we have our genetical background and we have our environmental uh, environments, okay? We know also that low vagal activity potentiate the effect of CRP in the prognosis of uh, myocardial infection. So, means that uh, CRP is a pro-inflammatory molecule, C-reactive protein, right? Pro-inflammatory molecule. And we know that uh, patient with high CRP uh, is related to autoimmune disease like depression, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but also um, uh, colitis, uh, and also in, uh, in myocardial infection. And when we have a high CRP level, it is always uh, 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 in relation, so it's, a, it's a, a, a negative correlation with CRP and low vagal activity, which means that when we have a high vagal activity, the CRP level is low. Okay, so anyway, it is possible to have a risk factor like hypertension and to have a normal vagal activity, right? Because the risk factor have other origins, such so genetic, environmental, or other acute illness. So, therefore, if we work um, on the environment uh, uh, side, right, we can also positively influence uh, those risk factors like, like hypertension and to reverse it, right, even with normal vagal activity. But, uh, Globally, globally, uh, uh, you will see that vagal activity is uh, inversely correlated uh, with the development of disease. And we know that low vagal tone is associated with, depress with depression and uh, other mental health disorders like anxiety and uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, post stress disorder, right? And we know that depression is a risk factor for prostate cancer and metastasis via sympathetic signaling. So again, here, when the sympathetic nervous system is too high, it will lead to depression, it may lead to cancer and metastasis, right? And, and, and uh, we know that in PTSD, uh, there is a high uh, sympathetic activity and there is a low vagus tone. Okay, so hyperactivation of this uh, sympathetic nerve activity will also can also modulate the gene expression because all DNA is not fixed. The gene can mutate in one way or the other, the other way, right? Because it can stimulate <coughs> macrophage infiltration, inflammation, again, androgenesis and tumor invasion, right? And uh, inhibiting apoptosis, so promoting metastasis of solid tumors. And solid tumors is very good to know because there is only one liquid tumor, which is uh, cancer of the blood, right? Otherwise, it's a solid tumor. And we know that uh, uh, where, where we have uh, a lower sympathetic activity, a uh, higher uh, vagus tone, right? Uh, we know that the, uh, the, the prognosis of patients suffering from uh, a solid tumor, like let's say uh, prostate cancer in, 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 in men, is much better. So if you mean that, uh, it means that uh, low vagus tone, high 
hepatic nerve activity is very bad for patients suffering from cancer. We have to reverse it. All right. So, uh, as I say, low vagal ac nerve activity may be a risk factor for disease and poor prognosis of those disease, right? And the uh, efferent vagal activity can be easily assessed by analysis of uh, variability of heart rate. When I talk in the beginning, do we have a cheap, uh, non-invasive, uh, 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 recognized uh, uh, tool to measure the, the, this, this, this vagal tone, uh, it is by the analysis of the uh, heart rate uh, variability, because heart rate variability is uh, High heart rate variabilities correlate with high uh, vagus tone. Low heart rate variability is uh, correlate uh, with disease. So we know that HRV uh, is inversely correlated. There is a negative correlation with the risk of and poor prognosis of uh, cardiovascular disease, but the same in the longevity of cancer, right? And uh, also, it's it's a high heart rate variability, which is correlated with high vagus tone. It's also correlated with better cognitive in, improvement performance in uh, uh, Alzheimer uh, um, disease, right? So we know that vagal activity is also uh, negatively correlated to the presence of MET component, right? And we know that, for instance, uh, high vigor, uh, vigor stone means high <clears throat> heart rate variability is, is, uh, is, uh, inversely related to diabetes. So it means that, uh, if you have a low vagus stone, low heart rate variability, then there is a, a negative correlation and the, 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 it can lead to the dia diabetes. We know that diabetes is correlated to low vagus stone and, uh, low heart rate variability. Okay, uh, Pascal, so, Pascal uh, we, we, have a, a, we have a yeah. question from the audience, and that is, how do you measure vagal activity? You already said that heart rate variability is the, is the parameter that's interesting, uh, but how do you measure that practically in your clinic? So, the best tool, because the heart is just innervated by, uh, the heart is a, uh, it's another example of uh, uh, autonomic uh, nervous system, right? So the heart uh, is like the enteric nervous system, the sympathetic or, or, or the one, the vagus. He has his own uh, uh, autonomic nervous system. And the heart uh, is innervated by the vagus nerve and is innervated by the sympathetic uh, nervous system. So this is very easy. So if the uh, the art uh, has a uh, high vagus tone input, we know that the heart rate will decrease. If the heart has a high sympathetic input, we know that the heart rate will uh, uh, increase, right? And there is the balance between the heart function and, and connection uh, between the, the vagus input and the sympathetic one should be normal. We know that uh, uh, a denervated heart beat about uh, a minimum 100 beat per minute, but uh, a connected heart, right, uh, with the vagus and sympathetic nerve uh, uh, system uh, beats at rest about 60, 65, maybe 70. It means that the vagus, the vagus nerve hacked like, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, a foot in, in, in the brake of the car. So you have, you have one foot in the accelerator, the sympathetic, and you have the other foot in, 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 in the brake, right? And this is the, the role of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve therefore decreases the heart. No, heart rate variability, the analysis of the variability of the heart rate, not the heart rate, but the variability, because the heart is not a metronome. If, your heart uh, is beating uh, 60 beats a minute 
and every second you have a heart beat, which means at the end 60, right, you will be dead in four days, all right, because the variability is zero. Heart rate variability is zero, okay? So uh, the, the, the heart rate vary in milliseconds uh, uh, like a wave like this, you know, uh, some short uh, interbeat intervals, some longer interbeat interval. We are measuring the interbeat interval. So uh, it's uh, on the QRS is the, the, R, um, the R signal, right? So heart rate variability, the best to measure heart rate variability is through an EKG. All right, it's not a Apple Watch, it's not a Polar Watch. Uh, first, Apple Watch is not uh, doesn't give any good heart rate variability. It's not uh, uh, you cannot trust this. Uh, Polar Watch or the system like this, they can measure HRV. Uh, it's good in healthy subjects. An empty subject, it's good. So if you study uh, heart rate variability in a healthy subject, you don't maybe need a AKG, uh, but uh, we are dealing with patients, so uh, therefore you need an EKG because the problem in uh, the polar watch or the system, they, they show you the, the QRS signal, so you don't need the heart signal. And the problem with disease, like for instance, depression, anxiety, uh, or uh, other diseases may lead to uh, abdominal rhythm, like pre-arterial uh, uh, contraction, pre-ventricular contraction, uh, 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 also atrial fibrillation, which is very common in case of athletes uh, like the cyclists, uh, you know, in uh, Tour de France, or people uh, use, used to uh, do uh, marathon, uh, marathon. Uh, you know, endurance sport is very well correlated with atrial fibrillation. And we know that uh, uh, atrial fibrillation can be can be uh, uh, reversed by uh, vagus, vagus nerve stimulation. So, therefore, the treatment needs to be focused to restore the sympathetic vagal balance, right? In this kind of uh, dysautonomia or when sympathetic activity normal or the parasympathetic weak or even if the parasympathetic tone is too high abnormally by stimulate the vagus nerve we will not increase this, this hyper uh, uh, autonomia but we will decrease it at this uh, uh, normal level so you cannot overstimulate the vagus nerve right uh, but you can overstimulate the sympathetic activity and uh, you know when patient is coming with pain, contracture in the muscles, it's just because the sympathetic nerve activity is too high. It's easy to measure it. Uh, there is, uh, you can measure the heart rate, you can measure the uh, respiratory frequency, you can measure the, the skin uh, conductance and uh, the activity of the sweat gland, right, for the sympathetic. But HRV is one because you can see very well the vagus tone, where is it? And you can see very well the sympathetic activity, uh, where is it? And when you have a patient, and before doing your treatment, you first do your AG to analyze this heart rate variability analysis, which takes uh, maybe half an hour of uh, assessment, and then you have your treatment, whatever the treatment, and afterwards you compare the effect uh, uh, that you induce by the uh, about this sympathy uh, vagal balance, right? And if the treatment is well done, it's well directed, right? Whatever it is, but you know that you have to uh, act on the uh, autonomic nervous system balance, then you will see a difference. You will see that the sympathetic activity decrease and the vagus tone increase just by your treatment. So. Here there is a just uh, uh, at the end uh, just a, a, a figure. Say on the left you have the afferent and efferent vagal uh, pathway, and you see that uh, uh, it can block due to this uh, activity. Huh? It can block the mechanism like sympathetic nervous system, oxidative stress, inflammation that uh, are risk factors for the metabolic syndrome. Here 
that will lead to disease on the right. But you see that on the top, as we said, we have the genetics and the environment. So the genetic uh, uh, a gene can mutate in good or in bad. N nothing is fixed in the body, right? Uh, this is called plasticity. And we know, for instance, that uh, vagus nerve stimulation uh, promote uh, neurotrophic factors that will in turn increase the neural plasticity. Like for instance, in multiple sclerosis, promote re regeneration of nerve, right? Because multiple sclerosis, as I, I show you in, uh, in the second part of my course, that uh, inflammation will just destroy the neurons, okay? So no inflammation, no neuronal destroy. But if there is genetics there, okay, so, uh, you cannot do anything for the genetics. They will mutate. You have just to improve the, the, the neural plasticity. But you can act on your environment. And uh, one of the most one is the food, right? And we know, for instance, that uh, uh, sugar promotes inflammation. So it's not good. That uh, anything sugar will promote inflammation, will promote the sympathetic nerve activity and oxidative stress. So a diet with low sugar, uh, low uh, low carb, because at the end carb is sugar, right? And increased fat will uh, have a very good effect because it will decrease inflammation, decrease sympathetic nerve activity, uh, the mechanism we see there. But at the other hand, it will stimulate the vagus nerve because fat uh, to be digest need, uh, need an hormone, which is called uh, cholecystokinin, CKK. And this hormone, the vagus nerve is a, is a receptor for this hormone, not only for this one, but for this one specifically. And this hormone is released by fat. And so if you eat fat, all right, whatever the fat, uh, it will stimulate the vagus nerve. So uh, we know that, for instance, a patient suffering from a, a irrit irritable uh, border syndrome or celiac disease, um, or uh, uh, or uh, inflammatory uh, bowel disease, right? Uh, like colitis, something like this. When we we promote this kind of of diet, uh, we have a, a measurable uh, vagal activity that will increase, right? So food is very very important also sport we know that moderate sport activity stimulate the vagus nerve not not uh not uh, over exercising so i mean you know everything should be balanced huh, in what we do so uh, it's good to do exercise but it's better to uh, to go to the gym once a week than to go to the gym every day or uh, or five times a week because this uh, is not favorable for the, the, the vagus nerve. I think we reached the end of the presentation. Uh, I want to be sure about that. There is mm -hmm. no, yeah, it is the end. The, the, Thank okay. you. Thank so you. So I'm coming back here and... Uh, maybe yeah. maybe let's uh, talk briefly before before we end uh, our, our evening. Let's talk briefly about what do you do to stimulate the vagus? You have mentioned uh, electric uh, stimulation already. Uh, do you want to talk about that for two minutes, just to give us an idea on how that works? So the best, the best uh, way to stimulate the vagus nerve, let's say the best because it's the strongest way. And some patients need a very strong uh, vagus nerve stimulation because the vagus, the vagus nerve is too low, the sympathetic activity is too high, because, and it's related to inflammation, oxidative stress, as, as we say, right? So in case of this patient, like, or you can treat patients suffering from epilepsy, or you can treat patients suffering from uh, severe anxiety, uh, a major depression disorder, resistant to medication, or you treat patients suffering from uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, uh, and, and uh, Crohn disease, for instance. I have, I have, uh, diabetes, right? I have so many examples. So uh, I use the non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, means that uh, non-invasive bioelectronic vagus nerve stimulation. So we use the electricity with different parameters, frequency and 
and modulation of the wave, right? I explained this in the course, mm -hmm. uh, that will, uh, will stimulate the vagus nerve or rebalance its tone, right? Usually it's too low, but sometimes it's too high. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, an example of higher vagus tone is uh, when people feel like heartburn, you know, over acidity. And uh, also uh, uh, gastroesophageal uh, hernia, right? That uh, will lead to acid reflux and uh, okay. And also food allergies, right? Uh, this is due to hypervagal activity. We know where in the brain it's, uh, it's, it's there. So, and when we stimulate the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve, as I said uh, previously, it modulates uh, about 80% of the total volume of the brain, which is very huge, right? So it will counterbalance the, the, the sympathetic activity from the prefrontal cortex or other uh, cortical area, in the limbic area, uh, for instance, right? And uh, by stimulating the, the vagus nerve very strongly uh, by electricity, uh, we know that we have, we will get positive results. So I have many examples that I will uh, tell the, the, the participant if they, they, they follow my course, uh, how successful is, it is. I have, as I told you before, a patient crossing Canada, uh, flying eight hours, coming to see me because there is no other means to treat like uh, in autism disorder. Okay, it's another example. So many like this addiction, mm -hmm. right? So uh, and it's very successful. Now, and when you have a do, patient, excuse me, which do, is do you just not... do you just treat the patients when they are with you in the practice, or do they have a device to take home and to treat themselves? So at, at the start, uh, we do several sessions at the practice mm -hmm. to be sure that it's safe. To be sure there is no side effect, like uh, not inducing migraines, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, other possible side effects, which are very, very rare, uh, rare because uh, tolerance and safety of uh, bioelectronic, non-invasive bioelectronic vagus nerve stimulation is very, very good. So what I do, I do, uh, I do the EKG first, do the analysis of the sympathovagal balance with HR heart rate variability. So the patient see, wow, okay, so no I understand why I'm like this. I just explained to the patient, say, you will see, we will do a 45 minute stimulation. Uh, okay, you come uh, uh, twice a week, we will do it for a month or something like this. So it's just uh, eight stimulation. And then we do another AKG heart rate variability. And the patient, because he has the, the vagus nerve stimulator, he will not be perfect. But he see the difference. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. you, you vagal, your vagal tone increase, HRV increase, and sympathetic. Okay, but sometimes it's not enough because patient with a very severe depression disorder, HRV at the beginning and at the end might be the same. So you need to stimulate. Mm -hmm. So after what I say, to the patient, you will get the device and you will do own treatment. So I will prescribe you. You have to stimulate you three hours a day or two hours a day, or just uh, one hour a day will be mm -hmm. uh, enough, but you, eat, you eat, do it every day, and then you come back at the clinic after uh, one month, we don't do an mm -hmm. other HRV, we'll see, and then the patient go back home, you continue, and, uh, and then you come after three months, and we do the control. And sometimes, just by eight treatments at the clinic, you can clear up uh, the symptoms. I have an example of a patient, it was a young female uh, uh, nurse patient. Uh, they came to see me with uh, uh, trigeminal uh, allodynia and uh, just flare up of the trigeminal nerve. And you know, painful it can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was on uh, anti epileptic medication for it. And she has a side effect for the, the medication. And she didn't want to take the medication. And she wanted something more natural, and then she saw the vagus nerve stimulation and said, okay, we know that the trigeminal nerve and the, the vagus nerve are very good friends. Mm -hmm. Embry in in uh, embryology, they, they come for the same uh, brachial uh, arch, and you know, uh, uh, it's five, uh, one, two, three, and four, and, and very, very close, good friend. So instead 
of stimulating the trigeminal nerve, we stimulate the vagus nerve. And I show in the course how stimulate the trigeminal nerve as well, especially it's good for uh, children. Uh, so by stimulating the vagus nerve, after six sessions, no more. Mm -hmm. She was painless, mm -hmm. 45 minutes, painless. And she told me, you know, I had heartburn before and I was allergic to tomatoes. No, I tried to eat tomatoes again, no more heartburn, mm -hmm. no more uh, uh, food allergy. So the vagus nerve is not to say, all right, uh, you target a specific frequency, it goes there, but no, because the vagus nerve, there is afferent and efferent, so mm -hmm. it goes everywhere. So it's the systemic effect. Mm -hmm. And I have a patient suffering from uh, psoriasis, Vegas nerve stimulation after eight sessions. So, so may, uh, may, we, may, I, may I interrupt yeah. you again? Uh, for some people, this will, for some of our colleagues, this will be an interesting uh, option to work with a device. Others will say, I don't want to do any electrotherapy, even if it's very effective. I want to work with my hands. Can we uh, also use osteopathic techniques to have a comparable effect on the vagus? And if you yeah. do that, what do you do? In which zones of the body do you work? Can you uh, give us a brief example for, to, to close our session for tonight? If, if you know your anatomy, mm -hmm. you have the answer, right? So the vagus nerve stimulates uh, or modulates uh, mostly all organ in the body. The only one it might not, we are not still sure, would be the spleen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but Although, otherwise, uh, it uh, stimulates uh, all the organs. So, we said uh, that uh, the vagus nerve has a very powerful natural immunosuppressant effect and anti-inflammatory action, okay? And the, inflam the, the inflammation, what is promote the inflammation in the body is our macrophage. Mm -hmm. Macrophage they are very rich in the, the part of the body that we talk, the, uh, we name the reticulo on the telia system. And the reticulo on the telia system organ is the heart, the lungs, right? The digestive tract uh, uh, and the GIT, okay? Those organs are very, in the spleen and the liver very rich in macrophage. So we have to see those organs, you know, you remember the, the somatovisceral reflex, all right? So we have the cartography in the spine related to the splank nerve, where they go, mm -hmm. right? From C7 to, to uh, from uh, T7, T9 or T10, we have the splanchnik goes to the celiac ganglia. Celiac ganglia go to the innervation of the, the spleen, right? Uh, and also other organ, right? So we have to find if in this area there is no lesion, right? If there is no overactivity of the sympathetic because there is a contracture, so the posture is very important. So we have to adjust those area, but also here, uh, C1, this, this, this C2. Is, but this, this is more an influence on the symp sympathetic nervous system, not on the vagus so much. Ah, you know that little John said, mm -hmm. the primary treatment is inhibition. It's inhibition. Be careful with inhibition because if you stimulate, if you inhibit, inhibit too much, it will lead to uh, stimulation, mm -hmm. right? So long treatment therefore are not good. So inhibition, why? Because we are more on the flight or fight than on the, the rest and digest. Mm -hmm. the, the, the vagus tone is, is high during the night, a bit in, in the morning, and then it's just sympathetic. And then the environment, you know, pollution, uh, the food, the pesticide, we promote the sympathetic. So we have to do inhibition mm -hmm. to the sympathetic nervous system then. And then afterwards, we can stimulate the vagus nerve, for instance, by uh, adjusting lesion in the upper mm -hmm. cervical, right, where it exits, make sure that all the tissue in the necks are free, Pericardian structure are free. You can stimulate, you can do a liver pump, spleen pump, cardiac pump, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and also 
a very uh, powerful uh, visceral uh, treatment to the guts, right? Because we know that uh, if we uh, uh, do, do gut treatment, right, we have a, a, a positive uh, action on the vagus nerve, mm -hmm. right? For instance, in autism, this is the brain and uh, the brain and the gut connection, mm -hmm. right? So I show, uh, so uh, I use the vagus nerve stimulation, bioelectric, okay? Because I practice integrative osteopathy. When I cannot use osteopathy or I say this treatment will talk, cost too much for a patient mm -hmm. suf suffering from depression. Uh, because what an osteopath can do for major depression disorder I'm not sure many osteopaths treat patients with uh, severe depression disorder. I'm not sure osteopaths uh, treat colitis or uh, other inflammatory uh, bowel disease, right? Well, uh, there, there are because studies it's very that complex. show that it's quite effective. Huh? There are studies that show that uh, manual treatment is effective in, in yeah, it does, bowel disease. Yeah, it does, disease. research, but remember that research is free. The that patient doesn't pay. When you do research, yes. it's free. Yes. So if the patient has to pay for the same stuff and, and last, right? Because you cannot say uh, I, I do five treatment and then that's it. No, it will go back naturally, right? So it's a very, very long management, right? And if you want to have an effective, the very, the cheapest and the most effective is vagus nerve stimulation by electronic medicine. Mm -hmm. No, if you have a moderate or not too high imbalance between, uh, I mean, not to a sympathovagal balance, right? You can do the, the, the osteopathic treatment. We know, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And I teach this as well, because uh, someone say, no, uh, here in Canada, osteopath cannot do uh, uh, electrical device. Mm -hmm. So you have to show us uh, what uh, osteopathic treatment can uh, change this sympathovagal. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, the first one is the GPOT. Mm -hmm. So, I have a course who from the mechanical aspects of the GOT, I connect it to the neuroendocrinal immunological aspect of the GOT. Mm -hmm. When we do the GOT, what area we focus, right, relate to the uh, just anatomy of the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. We have an action to the enteric nervous system, we have an action to uh, by the leverage we use in the GOT, right? And this is measurable because when I teach the GOT as a, as a basic uh, osteopathic treatment to improve the sympathovagal balance, I do an HRV, EKG, HRV before, mm -hmm. I do a GOT, 20 minutes, right? And then I do another uh, uh, EKG and HRV and we see the improvement. Mm -hmm. This is done with most of the time participants are healthy, right? So if your patient is not healthy, it will take longer time. Mm -hmm. Or other techniques, there are several studies showing that uh, manipulating C1, C2 uh, uh, improved uh, the vagus tone or, uh, you know, other uh, other study like this or uh, improving CIT. It's very recent uh, in terms of research, right? It's mm -hmm. just the start and the HRV or uh, the understanding of RL variability is very complex, very, very complex. Mm -hmm. But when you understand this, right, it's a powerful tool for you to measure and uh, objectively the, the benefit of your treatment. Mm -hmm. Because if after your HRV is, is the same or even lower, yeah. you say, okay, I don't do anything here good. Huh? Mm -hmm. I have to change my, uh, you know, my rifle from the shoulder and do something else. And this is the only stuff that osteopath doesn't use because they are not, they don't know about it, right? So I do, and in, in the, the courses, there is mm -hmm. a part, a chapter about heart rate variability and mm -hmm. we do the EKG and uh, we test before, we test after, whatever we stimulate electrically or manual treatment, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, in Austria, I will talk about the bioelectric uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. In Germany, I'm talking about osteopathic treatment for autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the same principle, but we use manual technique uh, instead of uh, electrical technique. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As, you. as you said in the beginning, 
it's a very interesting subject. It's a very complex subject where everything seems to be related with everything. And we are looking yeah. forward to hearing more from you when you come. I think in October we have we, we said. I think in October, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So thanks again. Have a nice rest of the afternoon. And uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you very much to you for the audience. I hope that uh, they understand uh, a bit bit more how it works. And uh, it's a very complex subject, uh, as you say. Uh, but uh, I go uh, in two different modules, level one, level two, to cover all the neuroendocrine immune, uh, immune system related to the, uh, to the vagus nerve mm -hmm. and the treatment, whatever it is, manual or electronic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Raymond. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you an euch fürs uh, Zuhören, fürs Dabeibleiben bei einer Sendung, die etwas länger war als die üblichen. Ein ganz spannendes Gebiet äh, und ein anderer Aspekt zu etwas, was wir mit unserer Psychoneuroendokrinen Immunologie ja schon jetzt einige Male gehört haben. Es gibt da immer wieder neue Bausteine und die Vagusnervstimulation ist da ein interessanter Aspekt, der da noch ein bisschen gefehlt hat und wo wir im Oktober von ihm mehr darüber hören werden. Im Café Stillpoint geht es nächste Woche wieder weiter. Für den Montag ist das Programm noch nicht fix und am Mittwoch gibt es eine zweite Sendung und da wird es die letzte Folge unserer Embryologie-Werkstatt mit dem Erich Meyer Falli geben, den ihr ja alle schon kennt. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören, schönen Abend und wir sehen uns demnächst, hoffe ich.